Hey guys, it's Michael and Ewan back after the annual forecast model learning exercise to move on to the next level of complexity. Now, today we're going to be talking about historical and forecast modeling, which is what we refer to as a rolling model. Um, rolling models are a lot more complicated in many regards than a standard forecast only model because you have obviously have to map your historical data from your historical income statement and balance sheet, which we're going to talk about. Um, and you need to basically ensure that everything rolls when the model rolls forward. And that makes everything quite a bit more complicated. So the main focus of this, this course is going to be the rolling mechanism. Um, all the finance theory we covered in the, in the forecast modeling, the annual forecast modeling exercise, still applies. Um, and we're, we're building basically the exact same model. So if you look at the model scope for today, we are building basically the same model of Wall Street promotions as we built in the last learning exercise. But in addition to the five years of forecasts, we are going to have three years of historical data. Um, and we're going to show you basically how to map that data into the forecast while allowing for rolling and scalability. So um, when we when we build this exercise, we'll, we'll start off by focusing on just the structure. Now, the financial model structure of an historical and forecast model is quite different to a forecast only model, predominantly because you don't have just an opening balance sheet. So we had just an opening balance sheet in our forecast only model. That made things a bit easier. You didn't have to worry about historical mapping of income statement items like revenue and expenses. So in this case, we're going to have an historical income statement, an historical balance sheet. We're going to map the data within those into our forecasts, and then we're going to have all periods financial statements. And that's the terminology we use with this stuff. You have historical financial statements, mapping into forecasts, and then you have all periods financial statements. And we refer to the basically the, the historical versus forecast nature of sheets as what time frame you're talking about. So there are some complexities around this. Now note that we don't do an historical cash flow statement in terms of importing data. We derive that. So we actually have an all periods cash flow statement, which we're going to discuss, but, um, but the historical component of the all periods cash flow statement is derived from the historical data in the income statement and balance sheet. The, so I should say the historical balance sheet. So, so the process basically is populate your historical financial statement data, derive your, derive your historical cash flow statement, but all of the data is going to pass through the forecast modules. Okay, so to start this model, to start this model, let's open the assumptions file. Um, the, the, the assumptions file is on the, on, the, uh, on the exercise, on the actual website. We've got the Wall Street Promotions Annual Historical Forecast Assumptions download. Um, it's very, very similar to the assumptions file for the prior exercise, but instead of having just an opening balance sheet and forecast assumptions, we have uh, an income statement balance sheet and forecast. So we basically have the historical financial statement data which we're going to import. A big part of today is also going to focus on how we can efficiently get that data into our model because getting that data in is, is normally quite a manual process. Um, we've automated that with Madonna, which is really powerful. Okay, so let's start by opening a new dynamic template. Now we're gonna open the exact same dynamic template as we did in the annual forecast model, but this one's gonna include historical periods as well. So it's gonna be an historical and forecast version. So we're gonna, we're gonna choose the same generic financial model chart of accounts one library. And within that, we're gonna select historical annual historical forecast. And you can see that for each of the periodicities we, we provide, um, other than weekly, which we just have historical and forecast, um, you have an historical and forecast option and just a forecast only option, which is the last one we chose, we chose annual. So in this case, choose United States. We're going to go separate assumptions and outputs as per the last exercise, no sales taxes, and click OK. All good. Okay. Now, once, once that opens, let's just do our standard setup. So let's put the entity name in as Wall Street Promotions in cell B1. And we'll go into cell B2 and we'll put that as, as annual historical and forecast model as the model name. Again, making sure you type into the, the formula so you don't lose the, the checks, the checks references. Yep. So Appreciate annual that. historical and forecast model. Annual historical and forecast model. <coughs> um, and let's just put the comment annual historical and forecast model of Wall Street promotions. As the note one, just remove the other two notes. And forecast model of Wall Street. Model of Wall Street promotions. I'm getting slower each time I write this. <laughs> It's strange because you're writing it a lot. Um, and let's del and delete those other two notes. Delete those rows. Sorted. Okay, so that's our dynamic template. You can see it's got separate assumptions and outputs because that's the that's the variant we selected. Um, and we're basically ready to go. Now you'll see if in our table of contents here, we don't have an opening balance sheet. We have a historical income statement and a historical balance sheet. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, let's just go to our time series assumptions. Now you remember in the last exercise, I think we had we forecast from 19, uh, we forecast from 19, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Um, I think by memory. In this exercise, we're going to actually have three years of historical data, which is going to be 16, 17, and 18. Okay, so let's set the, um, make sure it's annual, which it is December, financial year end, first financial year is 2016. Great. 
um, eight years, which is three historical, yep. five, five, five forecast, mm-hmm. and then there's nominations in thousands. Thousands again. And just make sure that our last historical year, we can obviously change that going forward when we roll the model, yep. which we're going to discuss in the budget variance course next. But for the time being, let's just leave that as 2018, so we have three years of historical now. Let's go to our historical income statement and just yep. verify that we have three periods there. So that's 18, 19, uh, sorry, that's 16, 17, 18. And then if we go to our table of contents and, and just go to our revenues and expenses, you can see we have we have those forecast five periods there. Visible. Cool. Now we're going to discuss more about how that all works throughout this exercise. So let's just go back to the historical income statement again. Easy. Okay, so the historical income statement, you can see it's, it's, it's very similar to how the opening balance sheet looked in the last exercise. It's just a bunch of hard-coded assumptions. Um, the whole point of this is just to collect data out of an, an accounting package or or an IM, whatever, where you've got some historical data you want to pump in for the basis for a basis of comparison with forecasts. Now, getting this data in is traditionally a pain because normally you have to copy and paste every every cell in, and you normally have to manually insert rows. And every time you insert a revenue row or, a, or an interest expense row, you have to put it through the whole model. This is obviously where the benefit of automated categories is powerful. And it's also where we have a tool called the Import Assumptions tool that allows you to do this mapping really, really effectively. Now, if you go across to the, the assumptions file for this exercise, you can see we've got the income statement sheet and the balance sheet. That's the data we need to bring in. So if we activate the income statement sheet there, go back into the model. Now you'll see, if you just, just quickly going back to the income statement of the assumption sheet, just look at the, if you go down the bottom of that, you'll see the net profit. I always just choose a number to start with. So you'll see we have net profit uh, after tax at the bottom there, which mm-hmm. is that, that 240.5. Yep. So that's the number we're going to be looking for going up to 261.5 in 2018. Okay. Okay. So let's go back into the historical income statement. Does that, I just do that as a sanity check because this tool will tell you whether you're reconciling. I always like to check before it does. Just have know, a number in your head. Yeah. You yep. never know if the historical financials are uh, rubbish. <laughs> Often they come out of an accounting package that it reconciles. So you just want to make sure they do. Yep. Okay. So let's go to the Medano tab. I click on in the data, in the get data group. Let's click on import assumptions. Now this tool is really cool. It, you can use it to import assumptions when you first build your model. And then when you roll it forward and it will automatically remember what you mapped when you built the model. Right. So, so we also at the moment, this will have changed a lot by the time a lot of people watch this video. We're actually allowing now mapping to a whole lot more accounting packages. We're adding Myob and Sage, and we're going to continually add them. We're also going to make it live link because at the moment, this initial process is saying we're going to make it live link so when you roll your models forward, they automatically update all awesome. the time. So, so at the moment, it's it's 99% manual. We're going to make it almost uh, 99% automated. We're going to make it about 100% automated within the next few months. So in this case, we're not going to import from an accounting package. We're just going to import from Excel. So click Excel CSV and click Next. And make sure with the worksheet range, you've got the assumptions file selected. So, so the worksheet the promotions, yeah, forecast assumptions. And you'll see it's just the rows range needs to be the sheet. Now, it'll automatically pick up basically everything that's on that sheet. So you can see it's basically taking the used range, yep. which, which it's the used range rows. Um, we'll leave the first column, the heading column. In some cases, if the heading column is, is further in, you've got all sorts of weird data in column A, B, and C. You can, you can, you can specifically state you want it to look for column B or mm-hmm. C or D. In this case, A will be fine. It's a pretty simple export out of an accounting package. Um, so we can click next. Awesome. Okay, now this is another fairly complex dialog, but it's all pretty obvious when you go through it. The The import range basically is in the background. It's picked up the dates. So if you move that dialog around a little bit, you can see it's picked up the 2016, 17, and 18 data um, behind the dialog box yep. um, back there. And then it's saying, where do you want to export the data from? So if you click on the ref edit, that little arrow to the right of the export columns range, this one. you click on that, it'll show you that it's, it's basically grabbed those columns. Okay. But if you weren't happy with the columns that are chosen, you can go and select them using that tool. So just escape out of that. Um, and we're back in here. So you can reverse columns. So sometimes when you export data out of accounting packages, it puts the data in reverse columns. So instead of being 16, 17, 18, it's, it's 18, 16, 17. It's always 18, 17, 16. <laughs> yes. um, and you can reverse the data coming in. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're not going to need to do that here. Now, this at the bottom, we have this assumptions mapping file. Right. And what the assumptions mapping file is, is just, it's just a file that's created when we do the mapping now. So when you specify what, what you want out of the assumptions file to go into the model and you marry them to categories, it's going to record that in that mapping file so that when you roll the model forward in a year, in this case, it's an annual, like a strategic planning model, for example, or if it was a budget model each month, um, it will remember what the mapping was. And that means unless you change your chart of accounts, it will automatically roll forward and automatically reconcile, which is the beauty of this platform. You Basically, the whole set and forget mechanism of integrating with accounting packages. So click New to make sure we specify we're going to create a mapping file, and then click Next. Okay. So you'll see here, it's giving us the target 261 point, 
What have we got there? 261.5. 261.5. And that's, it's taken the 2018. It's taken the last period just because most people are most familiar with their last numbers. Yes. Their latest numbers. Yep. So it's taken, we're looking for the 261.5. Now, we've got in the appendices of this PDF that I'm looking at now, we have the mapping. Um, but we'll do it on screen now to show you how it works. Now, this is a really cool tool. There are lots of ways you can do this. Um, you know, sometimes what I do is split my screen and mm-hmm. actually put, you know, this dialog on the right-hand side and Excel on the left. Um, if you know your numbers pretty well, it should be pretty straightforward because you know the categories. In this case, we're going to walk you through them and just show you how the dialog works. So in the left side of the dialog box, we have the actual accounts that have been detected in the source data that have values in them. Right. And you'll notice in this instance, these ones include totals. Um, you know, this again, this is something we are constantly improving. So I think over the next couple of months, we're probably going to change the way those accounts on the left look. So it's so to, to reduce the risk of you bringing in a total revenue line item, for example, we might right. not include those. At the moment, this does include those. So it includes basically every line of data. So so what we're going to do here is we're going to go, uh, we're going to basically grab the first three categories. So you can see our, our income is product launches, networking events, and information sessions. Mm-hmm. To bring them in, you just drag them. Drag and drop. So you drag them, drop, and you'll see it'll highlight in green when you're okay to land, and there you go. And then you've got your five, You've got your, what is that? 5904. 5904, which if you click, so down the bottom, you'll see under the options. First of all, we've got target. We've got our reconciles. So that, that's the line it's chosen for us to reconcile to. Mm-hmm. Um, if we now go down under options, you can see import values within those columns. Um, and you, so if you click on that, if you click, if you click on that there, you'll see there, you'll see that top level for 2018, we have the 5904.6. Right. It, that's, that shows us we've got that first bit right. Mm-hmm. Okay, so just press escape. Just ignore that. That's fine how it already is. And we're just going to work down. So ignore total income because we're bringing in the category. So don't okay. want the total. Yep. Um, you know, something worth noting is you can actually, you can actually, so say, for example, you went to product launches at the top there, mm-hmm. that category on the right, and you clicked on product launches. You could actually start typing now. You could start typing like Ewan. And you could rename that category Ewan. And you'll right. see in the background it's renamed it Ewan. Okay. And then if you wanted to, for example, you could remove, so remove those next two categories, networking events and network information sessions. Just using this arrow? Uh, no, just click on them on the right and yep. just drag them back to the left. You can use that arrow. You drag them back to the left. And then what you could do is grab those two categories again on the left and place them on top of Ewan. And what that will then do is create one category with a many-to-one mapping okay. with Ewan in it. Yes. Okay, so that's if you wanted to just have sales and you had 10 sales lines or you wanted to break your 10 sales lines up into a three, 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 and a one, mm-hmm. you could do it during that way. You could customize your category headings and do a many-to-one map. Okay. In this instance, we don't want to do that. So what I would do is I would unmap all three of those so I'm just clicking shift. on them, yeah, dragging them back. And then I would actually and I'll go in and actually drag those three on top of there. I'm on just, top? I've just made a mess of this for everybody, but I'm just teaching how it works. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you drag them on top there. So that's actually, so you see there it's actually added. So delete the UN category now. Just click on that and press delete. This is the cool thing about the automation, right? Mm-hmm. You can just map and drag around. So you see in the background, it's actually editing the actual Excel file. Yeah, live. Real time. It's yeah. not putting the numbers in yet, but it's putting in all the category headings. Okay. Okay, so let's put in the other revenue categories. So the other revenue categories, we have a rental income and other income. So drag let's drag drop. those in and then delete the uh, delete the, the, unne- the unnecessary, unneeded category. Mm-hmm. Now, with our operating expenditure, we have salaries and wages. This is a chart of accounts one, so salaries and wages embedded within Inbox. So we have salaries and wages, office lease, service providers, and general other. So select and click all of those and drop them, and you'll see that will add an additional operating expenditure category. So we have now four operating expenditure categories. Mm-hmm. Great, and now we have... Ignore the totals. Depreciation, let's just put that under, drop, drag that down under EBIT, uh, under EBITDA. There you go. And then remove the other two depreciation categories. Get rid of those two. <clears throat> the next line item is, the next one is interest on cash. So obviously, you want to ignore the totals, total expense, operating profit, interest on cash. And do we need legal fees and other expenses? Um, legal fees and other expenses, yeah. Let's bring in, uh, so, so interest on cash, you've done that first. So interest, interest on oh, cash. Oh, interest on cash interest is on cash, automatically it's done. It's automatically mapped because it's got the same name. So let's right. guess it. Is. So okay. that pulled in because It had both. the same heading. Okay. Yeah, they're both called interest on cash, both in the source data and in the model. There we go. It's great. And that's that's not an assumption heading. That's a non-category. Yep. So, um, yeah, so legal fees and other expenses, drag them across. Into other operating expenditures. Into other operating expenditures, yep. And I'll get rid of that third category. And you see we're getting close to mapping now. We're off by two, so we're off by a bit actually. We're off by 277 still. Okay, so interest expense. Let's bring our interest expense down. So drag and drop that one on. Yep. And that was the only category. Yep. And it's and this is this is always a good exercise because we're still way off. So income tax expense, bring that across. And there you go, now you're mapped. Cool. Okay, so you'll see it's gone green at the bottom. Mm-hmm. It tells you you've actually reconciled and, and you can basically scroll up and down and make sure you're happy with that. So the most important thing when mapping is bearing in mind that you want your model to be driver-based, whereas your accounting package is normally bookkeeper based which can mean anything <laughs> I mean, it can mean absolute chaos so i mean 
we always talk about the fact that you, you, you just can't take a piece of rubbish and polish it and turn it into a Porsche, right? But ideally, if your bookkeepers are creating an absolute mess with your with your numbers, you need to speak to them about reclassifying your accounts. Mm-hmm. In a perfect world, your accounts would be set up in a driver-based structured way so that they can go straight into your financial model and you can have historical forecast mapping of data. You know, we sometimes find companies that have five or six different product lines have just one sales line and a zero. And then we have to, you have to sort of, it's hard because it's hard to go one to many, but it's easy to go many to one. So you really want to try and get your, at a bare minimum, get your accounting package data with enough clarity in it so you can at least allocate into accounts in your in your package that work well. Okay, so once we've done that, you can, you can now check the different dates. And you see down the bottom, we have we have uh, period ending. Mm-hmm. That 18, just change that to say 17. And just check to see it's still reconciling. Yes. You can also click in the box on the right and you can do left and right keys. And if you scroll up to the top of that dialog and do left and right, there we go. you can see the period's changing. So you can scroll. So if you're in a monthly model with, say, 36 months, you can quickly use your fingers to flick across by going right, 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 left, 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 left. Just make sure everything reconciles. Okay. So you never want to import until everything reconciles. Or if it's off by 0.01, you say, oh, that's fine. That's just a rounding error, which sometimes happens with accounting packages. Okay. So let's press the import button. There we go. And so now, now yeah. you see it's saying to you, do you want to actually import from the uh, the balance sheet as well? That's just a tool that, that often detects that you, oh, you've done an income statement import. You probably want to do balance sheet. Just press no on that for now. Okay. What we're going to do instead is just have a quick look at the income statement link. So go to the, go to the um, build tab and just go module links. Okay. And we'll see where this is linking out to. <coughs> and then you'll see here. So the, and click on the show all links on that one, just show module links. You'll see the historical income statement, all that data that wasn't necessary when we just did an opening balance sheet is now going into the different forecast modules. So you'll see the revenues going into the revenue, all the revenue, revenues and expenses, fixed assets depreciation is being mapped into the assets module and our debt interest expenses going into our debt module, our corporate tax, because these all need to be in the all periods financial statements. Okay, so it's important to bear that in mind because we are gonna have to allow for the mapping of those when we do our forecast and understand how that works. Yeah, of course. Okay, so let's close that. So let's go to the table of contents historical balance sheet, load the import assumptions tool. Same again, Madano tab. Madano tab, assumptions. yep, import assumptions. Just click to Excel, select Excel again, Excel CSV. Now you'll see here, the assumptions file selected, but it's got the wrong rows range selected. Okay. So make sure, click on that drop down on the right, and just go to the balance sheet. What I do is I just select the entire sheet. So you just click the top, yeah, click that in the top left, that's just above the wrong column headers. So select the go. whole sheet, press mm-hmm. enter. Yeah, and what, the, what it will do is it will actually filter that down. Yep. Okay, so first heading columns A is fine, click next. And again, we're just going 16 to 18. Yep. Now you'll see it's picked up D. So if you click on export columns within columns, you'll see it's actually picked up the correct columns again. So we're, we're sort of ready to go here. So let's escape that, that's fine. Um, now we're going to do a new assumptions file, a new assumptions mapping file again, this one for the balance sheet. Mm-hmm. So, so that when we roll the model forward, we'll have that data. Of course. Let's click next. Okay, and the same process. So in this case, we're going to map that the cash has already been mapped because it's called cash. Mm-hmm. The debtors, you'll see the data we've got in this example is pretty nice and clean. Um, some of the data we have, you know, off in real life client models and real life user models are pretty, pretty, pretty dodgy. Um, you know, something, just let's just put the debtors in. So the, the three debtors categories, let's drop those in. Make sure we get a debtors number of 431.8. Yep. And then our other current assets are prepayments and other. Some accounting packages will just give you a blob of data for assets. So you do need to actually understand your accounts well enough. What I sometimes do with this is I print out the financial statements um, on a big PDF A3 document. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I actually sit there and, and, and mark them up and speak with the actual, the, the business owners and say, you know what? What is that? What is that? Is that because I mean something out of QuickBooks? Sometimes I just have like assets, and you won't know what's current, what's non-current, particularly if other than say book assets. So in this case, let's just go down fixed assets on that note, and you'll see we have office fit out, office furniture, and IT equipment. Map those ones in. Those across. Now, if you had, for example, which there are in a lot of accounting packages, you have contra assets for your book assets. So you have things like, um, you know, accumulated depreciation of PP and E. Now, if you have that. What you would do if you had, say, the office fit out, and instead of having your net written down value in your accounting package, if you had the 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 opening, the basically the purchase value, the, the accumulated purchase value, and the net written, and the, the, the accumulated depreciation, you would literally drag them on top of one category, which you call office equipment, mm-hmm. and that will contain the both the the asset, the accumulated asset plus the contra account on top of each other, and they would net off. And this import tool would put in a formula referencing both of those amounts for each period. So you would actually still get the right value. Okay. So even if you're accounting, even if your balance sheet contains weird things like contra assets, you don't want contra assets in your model. If you want to build your own modules that do contra asset modeling, you can. I've never built a financial model that contains accumulated depreciation as a state as a line item on the balance sheet because you just don't care. It's mm-hmm. not that relevant. 
Okay, so let's put in the other rental bond, direct loan, and other, which are other non current assets. Drag those ones down. Now onto creditors. Yep, because, and don't forget with this dialog, you can resize it. So you can stretch it up and down, right? Yeah, you can yeah. do that. I mean, I normally, yeah, you can do that. That's fine, actually. You can do that for now. Um, so creditors, so let's do with creditors. Let's do trade creditors, employment payables, and other creditors. Done. Great. Um, debt interest payable. There's that's, only one line, yeah, so that's one interest payable. Gone. Delete those two. Mm -hmm. uh, credit cards and other are our other current liabilities. Again, notice how we're missing all the totals. This is important. Yeah. Um, th the newer version of this tool I don't think is going to show totals because I think it's too confusing. We're going to sort of show it a different way. Mm -hmm. um, but, for the, but bear that in mind that everything still applies that we're talking about. It'll just be a slightly you know, invigorated interface, <laughs> for want of a better word. Um, okay, so bank debt, our debt facilities, our bank debt and working capital facility. Let's bring those in and delete the last, the third category. And don't forget, this is all flowing the whole way through the model. Yes. That's why that's why it's so cool. I mean, a lot of people say, oh, I just, I just want the mapping tool to do something. I'm like, yeah, the mapping tool is sort of the, the icing on the cake. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it only exists because of the cake. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so our other non-current liabilities, provisions, leases and other. Let's put those in. Drag and drop. <clears throat> yep. And now, yep, now we've got that 1017.9, which is which is actually the number we're targeting, which we didn't look at prior to, but normally you'd actually look at that. So we're looking at that for 2018. 2018, we are looking at 1017.9. Which is what we have. what we've got to. Now note that because the retained profits auto balances in this in this historical balance sheet module, it looks like we're finished. And it says, hey, we're reconciling. Watch out for that. You still need to put in things like other equity. So in this case, we have other we have ordinary equity of five hundred, which we need to put in, which is already in automatically mapped. And then we have other equity of you know twenty in each period. So bring that in, Done. just to make sure you don't get your ordinary equity wrong, because you know you could actually have retained profits being your whole equity if you didn't put any of those accounts in. <laughs> so bear in mind when it says it's mapping on the balance sheet, it doesn't necessarily mean it just means you've reconciled your net assets. It doesn't necessarily mean the balance sheet numbers are all correct. Okay. So you really need to verify this data. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's press import. That'll drop all the numbers in. Bring those in. There we go. And just verify at the bottom that we get the right number. 1017.0. That's great. Now let's just load the module links dialog. On the build tab, module links. Module links. Let's see where this is flowing through to. And you'll see this is almost, I think this is the identical links that you would see to um, the opening mail sheet. Yes. It's exactly the same. So we basically have the we basically have the closing cash balance from the from the historical balance sheet, like we had the closing cash balance from the opening balance sheet flowing through and the retained profits closing balance from the historical period. So you're going to have three periods of historical data just locked and loaded in your historical balance sheet, and they're going to be rolling into your forecast modules that are then going to pass through the all periods data into the all periods financial statements. And that that process of, a now, of, of that, flow, that flow through while for still facilitating rolling forward is what we're now going to talk about. Okay. But that's your historical financial statements done. Awesome. Cool. Okay, so the forecasts. Now, as, as discussed, in the last exercise, the forecast is something we spent a lot of time on. We talked about the financial statement impacts. Um, it's very similar to what we're going to do here, but we're going to focus, we're going to focus predominantly on, on the mechanisms of the roll forward in the historical forecasting corporation. And they become increasingly more complex as you move down the income statement. So let's start by keeping it simple, okay? Now, now here, I'm just going to check. So firstly, let's, let's start with revenues and expenses, okay? Now, in every case with our forecasts, we basically bring the data through into a module, do the forecasting like revenue, and then we then we bring the data coming out of that needs to be all periods data. So which means we do need to actually allow for the the, 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 the derived cash flow statement in each case. Okay. So revenue is quite simple because we assume that historical revenue equals equals historical cash receipts yes. for revenue, revenue cash receipts. So it's basically what we call a pass through. Now, what's really interesting about this is the structure. So if you go to you see that's our revenue. If you go to our historical income statement by the TOC. So 2B, and you'll see we have those three revenue categories, mm -hmm. right? um, you know, product launches, networking events, and information sessions. Those three categories, you'll see if you now go into your revenue expense forecasts. Yes. You'll see here, you'll see here that we have that last 2018 number there. So there's your 5904.6. Mm -hmm. Now you'll see that it goes from column L visible to column M visible. Now if you if you actually expand columns J, K, and L, you'll see that this this actually has all periods on it. Okay. Now this is a little bit inefficient in that you do have some, you do have a whole, a whole lot of extra rows sitting there, but what this enables you to do with the sliding doors is when you roll this model forward, which, which we'll do automatically with the Madano add-in, you roll this forward and it will literally add another period of historical data to the historical income statement and balance sheet, and then it will hide that period on the forecasts, which means you don't need to move any assumptions. Okay. So what we used to do back in the old days is we'd roll the model forward and say, oh, we need to move everything across the period because we've now got an extra period. It all got pretty messy because your assumptions were in the wrong column. 
That's not necessary when you take this approach. Now, what we've done to make it really clear that those periods in the, the 2016, 17, 18 years are, are what we call inactive assumptions. They don't go anywhere because your historical data is coming from your historical income statement. Right. Is we use conditional formatting. So if you select, say, J, set day 14 mm -hmm. and just do Alt OD, I suppose you could do data tab, conditional formatting. Yep. And, and you look at that. So just edit that rule. You see what that rule is just saying is if the period number, which is the period number of counter rows J7, mm -hmm. period number is less than or equal to the drop down box, the time series drop down box, the last historical year number then it's saying apply this format which is which is basically white back, uh, basically no background color and gray font color just so people don't think they're active assumptions now we call that inactive can we inactive assumptions conditional formatting mm -hmm. <coughs> and it's and it's basically the key to making it really clear in these cases when people start using this model that those assumptions aren't going anywhere now with revenues and expenses the key to this is, is, is understanding how this actually works now if you go to the revenues and expenses and you go to the outputs so click on the outputs link and you open up that. Bear in mind, with an historical and forecast model, there's always going to be these inactive columns that are hidden, that yes. are grouped and hidden. That's just so model users don't get confused because this sheet ultimately is a forecast sheet. If you want the historical data, you go to the historical financials. But you still need the data on here because what you want is, is in this case, you want all periods revenue data flowing through to your all periods financials. Yes. And that's what this does. So you notice that a huge point to note is you don't have your all periods financials saying, it's you don't have your all periods income statement saying, if I'm in historical period, do this. Otherwise, this, your all periods income statement is still exactly the same as your forecast only income statement. It just links in revenue. Yep. That 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 processing of historical data mapping is all done in the in the modules in between the historical financial statements. So other than the opening cash balance and the and the opening retained profits balance, which are actually your closing historical period balances. Right. Yep. Other than those balances going into your your all periods balance sheet as opening balances. You don't actually have data, any other data flowing directly through. So the revenue doesn't go from your historical income statement into your all-periods income statement. It goes into your from your historical income statement into your revenue module, and that process it. And you see how it does it here. Look at that formula. So traverse that formula, Alt L U R, or just go to Build Tab Auditing Traverse Formula, and you'll see it says if the period number J seven above yep is less than or equal to click on that. Which is, which is twenty, which is actually the cell link value under there, which is going to be three because mm -hmm. it's a drop down list of all the years is less than or equal to the last historical period, then take the historical income statement value. So that's a link in. Yep. Otherwise, take the assumption here. And obviously those first ones are going to be ignored because they're within those first three periods. Yeah, of course. Okay, so this is the key to how this works. And it doesn't matter how complex your revenue becomes, ultimately your first three periods in this case will be inactive and all your caps will be on those in that output section, which could be in the same component or could be in a different component. Um, but you have to do the, the, the pass through has to happen somewhere. So you've yep. got to say, You've got to say, and that, that's what we call a pass. That's what, that's what we call a pass through, which facilitates obviously the historical data flowing through into the all periods. Okay. So, and then very quickly, if I was to traverse a forecast period formula, then we can see here we're pulling from that active assumption exactly. versus the historical income statement. Exactly. And that's our slow key. So this is this is how we forecast that if statement that says if historical period take historical financials, otherwise do what you would have done the forecast model. If you think about the annual forecast model exercise. This is exactly the same, but you just didn't have those three columns and yep. you didn't have historical data. So you just did equals the assumption. That was it. So it was really simple. So In the formula case, changes just that historical section. Exactly. And that, that, that is a, that's a consistent theme across every single module that's in between the historical financials and the all periods is that you have an if historical period, do one thing. Otherwise, if forecast, do what you would have done in the annual forecast model. And then all the logic with regards to how those forecasts then flow through, like the module linking into the financials, is exactly the same. It's just this rolling mechanism, and it's really tough. I mean, this is why prior to this structure and prior to Madonna automating this, this is the bane of ex the existence of most uh, FP&A teams, strategic planning, budgeting planning, which is why people go and buy Oracle and Hyperion half the time because they just can't do this in Excel. Yep. So it's a bit of a, a game changer, this stuff. Okay, so so let's just look. Let's just now go into, just look at the income statement. Just go to the income statement. In, the all periods. Um, all periods income statement, so 3A, and just open up the revenue. And you'll see that the revenue is just coming in exactly the same as it did in the forecast only. Mm -hmm. And then you scroll down to the cash flow statement. Looking at the receipts. Yep. Cash uh, Revenue, cash receipt. You see the revenue there? Yep. So this is, again, pulling just from revenue and expenses. Just from revenue and expenses. And, and now notice we don't have a first period. In an historical and forecast model, we don't have a first period for our cash flow statement. And that's because the historical periods are derived, which we could have it for revenue, but for something like assets, for something like other current assets or other current liabilities, the only way you can derive the cash is by taking the movements. Mm -hmm. 
So therefore, in the first period, we don't have a movement because we don't have an opening balance sheet. Now, we could have got around that by having an opening balance sheet for the end of, in this case, the end of 2017. We don't really do that. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the historical the historical cash flow statement is indicative. Um, it's derived. It's good to have. Um, but at the same time, it's not something people obsess about. You're probably more obsessed with forecasting your cash than looking at it. Yeah. I mean, I was looking the other day at say zero on QuickBooks, and they don't even have a proper they don't have a proper cash flow. They've got like a cash summary, but they don't give you this type of analysis. So that first period isn't there in this model. You could customize it to include it. We've never done it. Never had a problem with it. Okay, so let's just go to our revenue revenue module again. Just go to the assumptions or the outputs. Okay. Just click on the module links. Build tab links again. Yes. Yep. And just note that it's exactly what we saw in the forecast model, but you've got that historical income statement data coming in Mm -hmm. for your historical periods. Other than that, it's the exact same links. Right. Okay, so let's go on a bit of a rampage putting numbers in. Because the historical headings have come from our historical income statement, we don't have to worry about headings, which is great. So just go to your assumptions file and just paste in the values from the the income statement. Uh, Sorry, from the forecast sheet. Just for the revenue? Uh, Let's do do them all because the operating experience is exactly the same. Okay, so we're done. So, so you'll see, <coughs> let's just have a quick look at what's happening. Now, we went through this in detail in the, in the annual forecast model. The only thing to bear in mind if you go to the outputs for this is just look at the operating expense chart. It's exactly the same, same as the revenue, just different links. It links into, it's an expense in the income statement and it's a cash payment on the, on the, on the, on the, on the cash flow statement. Mm-hmm. The other revenues and expenses are exactly the same. So you'll see down below, we have that linkage. So you'll see here the rental income there. The rental income, that's where we have the if statement in the rental income there. Mm-hmm. And then down below, we have that allocation, which is based on those drop down boxes. Yes. And that's the data that will link out of the cash flow statement. So if you go to the cash flow statement, uh, go, uh, sorry, go to the through. financial statements, uh, outputs, scroll down to the cash flow, and you'll see, you'll see there you've got other cash receipts. Yes. That other revenue cash receipt line item there in row 176. Yes. That's coming from there, which you'll see it's literally again just saying grab it from there. Yep. So I might just go back and I need to update the allocation of those other items. So we had yep. so operating cash, operating, operating. So operating cash. And then these two will both be operating. Operating. So now we're good. Great, we're good. And that's it. And that's it. So it's exactly, I mean, so once you get used to this, to be honest, <coughs> an historical forecast model is, is almost identical to a forecast model from the model user's perspective if you don't want to understand how it works. Yes. You just put in your historical data, you put in your forecast, it feels the same, but you've got historical data. From a model development perspective, you need to think constantly about the fact that where's my historical data coming from? Where does it pass through? Where am I deriving cash, etc.? So revenue is easy. Revenues and expenses are easy because they literally pass through. They just are what they are. Mm-hmm. Things get more complicated when you start bringing the balance sheet in. So let's do that now. So with let's move on to debtors and creditors. Now, with debtors and creditors, exactly the same. Is So I'll give you the allocations on these, actually, just to do it here because it's easier for you. Mm-hmm. So product launches, networking events, and information sessions is just allocated to the, to the debtors with their corresponding names. So mm-hmm. debtors, product launches, debtors, yep. information. debtors, networking events, and debtors, information sessions. Yep. Okay, and then the other two are just cash. And we have the debtors, we have 30 days, for 30 days, 20 days, and 15 across all columns. 30, 20, and 15. 30, 20, and 15. Easy. And this is the exact same logic as what we had now. Again, all the complexity here, you'll see that we're bringing in the revenue uh, there exactly the same. See, we're ignoring the historical periods. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're basically saying if it's an historical period, don't bother. So if you open up, the, if you open up those columns, you see yeah. we're ignoring those just to make clear we don't want them. And again, this also has the conditional formatting on those. Exactly. Well. It's just to make it so people don't think, what are the, where's that going? Mm-hmm. Now, if you go to the outputs, go to the outputs for debtors, you'll see if you go down to the debtors down below, Basically, if you, if you open up the columns on this, you'll see that basically the historical periods aren't going anywhere down below because mm-hmm. we, we, we're just forecasting our schedules yes. based on debtors' days. And mm-hmm. we went through that in the annual forecast model. So you'll see what we do up above, though, is we need the financial statements to still contain all periods of financial statements. Now, what we have from the historical balance sheet is our closing balance. So if you open up, say, Rose, yeah, that last closing balance thing, you can see there that's where our closing balance is coming from. Right. And you'll remember from the annual forecast exercise that with with debtors and creditors, the way we balance the financial statements is that the debtors and creditors go into the balance sheet and then the movement in debtors and creditors goes through as a, as a, as a working capital adjustment through the cash flow. Yep. So we can derive the working capital adjustment by looking at the difference between the opening balance and the closing balance in each period. So if you look here at, say, you look here, for example, at, uh, let's say one of these, say product launches. Mm-hmm. Product launches closing balance in 2016 was 257.4. Um, and then the opening balance for the next period is... Um, uh, and then the closing amounts for the next period is that 
So it's 4.1. Yep. So it's gone up by 26.7. Now, a debtor going up by 26.7 means your cash has gone down because you've actually shot invoices out that you haven't received. Yes. So we should see a decrease in cash on the cash flow statement. So go to the cash flow statement. 3A. Yes. And go down to there. You see that 26.7 in row 171. Yep. Okay. So what we've done here is is we've calculated the close for, for historical purposes. We've we've derived the movement based on the movement in the debtors' balances on the historical balance sheet that we imported. Mm-hmm. For the forecast, we've done it the same way we did in the annual forecast. We've forecast based on a debtor days assumption, the closing balance of debtors, and then and after and allocated revenues to that. And that that closing balance difference of the opening has given us the actual decrease in debtors for the forecast. Yeah, of course. So it's exactly the same as the annual forecast model, but for historical purposes, we're deriving that. And note that that, that derivation of that historical cash movement for the cash flow statement takes place in the debtors module, not in the cash flow statements. Yes. And that's the key because things are about to get much more complicated for us as we move into something more complex than, than debtors. Um, so you need to bear that in mind. You need to get the rec- reconciliation work done and the balance sheet items balancing prior to them coming into the balance sheet. Otherwise, you end up with a balance sheet that is your whole model. And I remember, I mean, in investment banking, a couple of times I got stuck with a balance sheet that didn't balance. And I was just there till four or five in the morning, just removing line items, trying to work out what was going to make it rebalance. And I'm like, oh, is that one thing I missed? You should balance before. And if you go back into the debtors module and you go to the outputs of the debtors module and you go to their total error checks, you open that up, there's a balance check. Yep. Same so as. Balance check. Exactly the same as the annual forecast model. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's go to the just go to the creditors and let's put the creditors numbers in. The allocation for creditors is salaries and wages allocated to employment payables, mm-hmm. office lease is cash, service providers is trade creditors, general and other is other creditors, and then legal fees and other expenses are cash. And then our days again, the consistent across all periods, we've got 14, 22, and 30. And I'll copy those across, and that's how our creditors done. Yep, and let's just let's just confirm when we've done that. Let's just confirm that our, I just want to confirm that our balance sheet, our balance sheet after doing that, our total equity, say in, our total equity net assets in 2023 should be 3597.6. That's what we've got. Perfect. Okay, so let's just look at the debtors links. So just go to the debtors outputs. Debtors outputs in 3C, build tab module links. Yep. And this again should be exactly the same, but we bring in the data from the historical balance sheet rather than the opening balance sheet. Yep. So... It's funny, debtors is modeled almost identically. Now, if you remember in the annual forecast model, what we did with the opening debtors balance is we just we just rolled it off, which we just put it as a movement in the first period. Mm-hmm. But that's why we had we did do that because we had that issue with the, you know, what do we do with that opening balance? And we just literally um, we literally just rolled it off in the first period. Um, so so it's it's a very, very similar piece of analysis because this one just has the debtors, because we don't have an historical cash flow. So it's the derivation of the movement in cash that's the key to understanding that module. And that's debtors and creditors. Sort of. Okay. Now, let's move on to fixed assets. Now, you notice as we move further down the income statement, and I say this because obviously in the balance sheet, fixed assets is depreciation. It's, it's a non-current asset on the balance sheet. You get Things get more complicated. Now, the fixed assets module is much more complicated for the main reason that it contains multiple accounts in the historical financials, and it's category-based. So if you go to the income statement, actually start with the balance sheet. Go to the historical balance sheet in okay. 2C, whatever it was, and then scroll down to fixed assets. I think Sorry, so. Fixed assets. Far. Fixed assets. Yeah. So fixed assets there. You've still got office equipment, office furniture, and IT equipment. Yep. Now you'll see there we have three categories. But if you but if you now go to the if you if you remember in the all period in the in the forecast model, our fixed assets forecast capital expenditure. So we have an opening balance of fixed assets plus capex minus depreciation equals our closing balance. Okay. Now the problem we've got here is that we that that's like an equation, simultaneous equations almost. We have we can look at it two different ways and back solve. Now here, our fixed asset we go from we go from in that period say for office furniture we go from seven thirty point four for office fit out office fit out sorry yep seven thirty point four to what's that five nine eight point nine five nine eight point nine now if you if you go back to the historical income statement we're sort of sitting there going what's our depreciation oh it's one category which yes. is not unusual mm-hmm. so we don't have office fit out depreciation mm-hmm. what we do have sorry if you go back to the historical balance sheet. Yep, in through 2C, yep. What we do have is our fixed assets movement from period to period. So our total fixed assets we know goes from 850.7 to 738.5. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> let's go to our let's go to our fixed assets um, assumptions. Let's just put these in so we've got some numbers. Okay. So actually, actually, not, actually, let's try doing something. Let's try not looking at that first. So let's go. Let's go to our let's go to our uh, all periods income statement. Easy. So you see our all periods income statement, if you scroll up, look at depreciation. So open up depreciation. 
you see what we've got here. We've got depreciation, historical depreciation, straight over income statement. We okay. put that out separately because what we've had to do with this, and, and we mentioned this briefly with debt in the op, in the fork, annual forecast model. With debt, we chose debt closing balances as the key account for the as the as the as the key account like to map. Now we call this key account mapping. Key account mapping is where you have multiple pieces of historical data. So, for example, depreciation and closing balances of assets. It's category based data, but they're not in line. So. The way our historical financial statements work is we say, okay, we're going to assume that data coming out of accounting package isn't going to be beautiful. It's not going to be perfectly split depreciation, perfectly aligned with closing balances of assets. Mm -hmm. So on that basis, you've got to say, well, one of them's got to be the key account. Now, the key account is the one that we forecast through the model and maintain the categories consistently with the historical. We normally always choose the balance sheet, closing balance as the key account where you've got a balance sheet item. So in this case, our fixed assets closing balance is our key account the depreciation is non-key, so we basically just roll it off. So what that okay. means is, what that means is, we're going to with that depreciation, we're just going to put through the historical depreciation there, and then we're going to we're going to take the closing balances and forecast depreciation. So you see, at the moment, we don't have any depreciation for forecast purposes because mm-hmm. we haven't forecast that. We haven't put rates in yet. Right. We haven't actually put capex in, mm-hmm. and we haven't actually put our depreciation rates in. So it's just so it's just we don't have any forecast depreciation. So if you go to um, just scroll down now to your balance sheet. Yes. And you'll see our fixed assets if you open that up. Our fixed assets aren't being depreciated. So they're just saying at 600.6. Yeah, they're just flat. Just flat. Now, if you go down to your cash flow statement and go to your capital expenditure. Uh, where are we? Fixed assets, capital expenditure. Yep. You'll see we actually derive the CapEx for historical purposes. Right. This is where it gets complicated. Okay. So <clears throat> now we don't have a CapEx figure. CapEx, we don't have an historical cash flow. We're deriving it. Now, what we do know, and this is just simple maths, but it's kind of messes with your head we do know that that if you buy a chair you buy a chair it's a very expensive five-year-old chair you buy a chair they offer a desk for a thousand dollars and you buy it at the start of a period and you depreciate it over five years you're going to put capex through a thousand and then you're going to appreciate it 200 per year down to zero now in that period in that period in your first period your depreciation will be 200 your capex will be a thousand so your opening balance would be effectively your opening balance would be zero your capex would be plus 1,000 minus depreciation of 200. So your net written down value on the balance sheet would be 800. Now you'd be able to back solve. If I gave you depreciation of 200 mm-hmm. and I gave you capex of 1,000, you could back solve your, your uh, sorry, I, I, if I gave you a closing balance of 800 and depreciation of 200, then I could give you, I could, you could back solve and say my capex must have been 1,000. Right, yes. And that's exactly what we do here. So we say your historical depreciation um, plus your decrease in historical fixed assets is equal to your fixed assets capital expenditure. So you see in this case, let's work through one of these. Okay, so so in this case, we've got a decrease in historical fixed assets. So decrease in historical fixed assets of 102.2, right? Mm-hmm. Um, now that offers fit out. So that 131.5, let's have a look at that. Now 131.5, that's a decrease of 131.5. Right. Now to the extent, to the, the difference between the, the decrease in the asset value and the depreciation has to be effectively your capex. Of course, yeah. So, 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 it's, so, it's, so it's the item you're missing. Mm-hmm. Okay, so here, that 124.7 is effectively... Uh, it's, oh, let me just show you on this. I'm just going to show you the best way to think about this. Let me just find this. In the, and this is all in the, in the PDF. It's quite complex stuff, so it's worth looking at these equations. Let me just map this through. Bear with me. Done it for a bit. Yeah, we have done it for a bit. Okay, so debtors and creditors. And fixed assets. Fixed assets. Now, you'll see here... I'm just going to show you some equations because equations are awesome. Yeah, so here we go. <coughs> so we know, we know that, we know that opening, as I said before, your opening balance plus your capex minus your depreciation equals your closing balance. So on that basis, your closing fixed assets equals your opening, as I just said, plus capex minus depreciation. Therefore, your capital expenditure equals your closing fixed assets minus your opening fixed assets plus depreciation, or as a negative number for the cash flow statement, capital expenditure equals negative. Closing fixed assets minus opening fixed assets plus depreciation, or capex equals opening fixed assets minus closing minus depreciation. Now your opening fixed assets minus your closing is actually equal to your 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 decrease. Yes. So that's so your capex equals your decrease in fixed assets minus depreciation, which is what we've got there, and that's how you calculate it. So all we've done is reverse the equation and said, hey, we don't know what capex is, but we do have depreciation, our opening balance, and our closing. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we can't do it in the first period because we don't have an opening. And we back solve it. And that's how we derive the historical implied capital expenditure. Right. 
So once we've done that, so it's, it's complicated, but this, this is the key. You've got, to, you've got to take the missing pieces and say, well, whatever I'm missing must be my cash if, if everything else is income statement and balance sheet. Okay, so, so go back to your um, fixed assets assumptions and let's just paste those assumptions in. I think I'm wary of, of, of not telling you what they are. Well, we can put them in. Um, yep. Let's just put them in. I think they'll be whole numbers. Uh, okay, op- depreciation, opening depreciation, office fit out 2.6, 3.0 for office furniture. And 1.5 for IT equipment. Awesome. And then depreciation years for CapEx are 6.0, 4.0, and 3.0. 6.4 and 3. 6.4, 3. And our capital expenditure allocations, this is exactly the same as in the annual forecast model. Mm-hmm. Uh, office, fit, office fit out, office furniture, and IT equipment. Okay. And I imagine that that will marry up with the Oh, so we, no, we do need to put that in here. Sorry. Let's go back. So just double click on that. Or I suppose if, if you don't have edit directly and sell on, just go to your table of contents. Go to your table of contents and just go to your um, fixed assets assumptions in 2F. What do you want our revenue and expenses? Oh, sorry, revenue and expenses. In, in one, was that 1D? Uh, I'll just double check. Uh, yes, 1D. 1D. Okay, and just go down and, co- and copy and paste your capital expenditure headings in and your values from the forecast check. Oh, so I'll just copy that from the assumptions file and the forecast assumptions. Done. Oh, maybe not. Does not like it. Okay, so once you've done that, let's just let's just make sure after doing that, let's just go to our um, let's just go to our fixed assets. On the let's just go to our balance sheet and look at our fixed assets. And if we've got that right, our fixed assets in two thousand and twenty-three, the closing balance, the total closing balance should be eight five five point nine. That's what we've got. Perfect. Um, and you can see you can see now if you go to your income statement, you see how you've got the forecast mm-hmm. and the historical. Now that's because that's that's the non-key account. Okay, so if it was the key account, which the closing balance was, you have all periods reconciled. So if you go down to the fixed assets down below, you can see in 91 to 94, the key account always is wrecked because that's what we've chosen as the key account to map. Mm-hmm. The others don't, but it still balances. And that balance check, if you go to the fixed assets outputs. Going back to that. So that is in 3D as well. And the error check, did you say? Yeah. Cool. So we've got the balance check. Balance That's check, the usual. exactly the same. So it's exactly the same balance check as we had in the all periods. Mm-hmm. And for historical purposes, um, for historical purposes, we just don't even, I don't think we even bother. We don't even bother with a balance check. Oh, yeah. There because, you go. It, because it's calculated. So that's your if statement again. If it's a historical period. Ignore it. No. Don't do the check. Of course. And that's it. So this so this is the key to basically how we, how we, how we do this pass through. You choose an account to map, which is your key account. Mm-hmm. And then you, the other ones you just have to manage and they're not mapped. And you effectively have historical, you have having historical data offset like we do with depreciation. So let's just go to our links. Just to click on module links, build tab, module links. Once more. Now you see, exactly the same as the annual forecast model, only we don't have, uh, only in the annual forecast model, we didn't have an historical income statement link in because we yep. didn't have a historical income statement. We just had an open balance sheet. So we didn't have to worry about key account mapping for that one. Yep. Which is why in the all periods, uh, in, in the forecast forecast annual model, annual forecast model, we only had to start worrying about key accounts with, uh, with debt because debt had debt closing balance and debt interest payable. So we had to worry about that when we did a similar thing to what we did here. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's go to the balance sheet and just check that our net assets in 2023. The last period of net assets figure is a good number to check if you're targeting something because obviously it's the final output of the model. Mm-hmm. Let's make sure that's 2761.6. Good. All reckons are live. Great. Winning. Okay, so let's do debt. So debt gets even more fun, okay? Now, now as, we, as I said just, just before, in the all in the annual forecast model, debt was complicated because we had interest. We had on our opening balance sheet, we had debt closing balances, mm-hmm. and we had debt interest payable, but they weren't mapped one for one. Yes, for the same reason here that you allow someone to bring in something out of say Hyperion, QuickBooks, SAP, and now they might have their interest expenses one line, but they'll have the debt facilities potentially as commercial paper, bank debt, blah blah blah, working capital silly. So we chose the closing balance for debt as the key account, and the other ones we managed with that. With what we called a debt opening balance, debt opening data module, historical data, I think it was. Or well, probably. no, it was debt opening and annual. That's the thing. Okay, remember, when we had an opening balance yes. sheet, it was debt opening. In this one, we're going to, we're going to use a debt uh, and historical data. So if you okay. go to the, if you go to the debt here, if you go to the capital capital sheet, you see at the top we have um, yeah. So let's have a look at this. So we have our debt, our bank debt, debt assumptions. Just click output. Just click through the outputs. Now you see at the top, this is a, this is that debt historical data, yep. and that's actually a separate module to the bank to the to the debt facilities, which are, which are modules as categories, mm-hmm. which is what we went through in the annual forecast model. This is quite complicated, but obviously we retain the category based data 
we, we only look at for category based data we bring in the the key account which is the closing balance mm-hmm. which we're going to do in a minute um, so it's worth looking at this so let's look at bank debt go back to the historical balance sheet historical balance sheet okay historical balance sheet and you'll see our bank debt down down in non-current asset non-current liabilities <laughs> is bank bank debt is 950 going up, going down to 850 right yep now if you go and you will see we've also got in there debt interest payable which is related to debt, but is not two categories. So mm-hmm. we don't have it broken out by facility. Then we also have, if you go to our incomes, the historical income statement, we have interest expenses one line, which is not unusual. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the problem we've got there is our key account, which is debt closing balances, is two categories. The others are one. We can't rely on them being the same if they add new debt categories. So we're going to pass through the non-key accounts through our debt historical data module. Right. So if you go to the if you go to the um, the debt yeah the, the capital output so uh, two e. And you look at that debt historical data, just expand those rows and the columns. So expand out the rows and the columns. So this is where the data is coming from. The, the note, note the, debt, the debt historical data, the debt interest expense, for example, doesn't go from the historical uh, income statement into the all-period income statement. It goes into the debt historical data module. It's a non-key account. So it basically comes in here and we you see that, that one of, what is it, 105.6? Mm-hmm. You see that is going to pass straight through into the, um, into, the, into the income statement. So if you go to the all-period income statement, uh, yes. And you open up interest expense. Net interest Net expense. expense. You'll see there we have interest, historical interest expense just coming through. Yes. Just just like we did with historical depreciation. Mm-hmm. It just goes straight through. We assume that that equals that that equals um, that equals that equals interest paid, um, subject to movements in interest payable, which is which is what we're going to discuss in a minute. So <clears throat> let's start. Let's start. I'm going to wind this back a little bit. We want to look at the debt balances to start with. Now the debt balances. Um, actually, which which order shall I do this in? Let's do the debt balances first and come back to this. Okay. So let's go to our historical balance sheet and look at our debt balances. Now here, our debt balances change. So we've got like 9, 950, 900, 850. Mm-hmm. For the bank debt, the working capital facility, we have 60, 45, and 55. And you'll see that there are movements there. Yes. Now the problem we've got is we don't know. We don't know whether in 2016, well, I'll take 2017 because we don't have a, a cash flow statement for 2016. So we don't know whether in 2017 that that, that reduction from 950 to 900 was a straight 50 payback, 50,000 or 50 million, whatever, I think it's models thousands, 50,000 payback, or whether they refinanced a million and then paid back, refinanced, paid back the 950, refinanced a million, then during the year paid back 100. Mm-hmm. So we don't really care. So this is where the drive cash flow statement is indicative. But we, but what we can do is we can say any increase in debt, we can assume is a drawdown. Any decrease in debt is a repayment. So that's how we, we get this section to balance. So <clears throat> what we do is if you look at, if you go to the debt outputs now, Actually, so just go to the debt. Um, yeah, just go to the debt outputs. Actually, debt outputs. The yeah, capital, so two E, and, and just look. 3A. You see what we've got for bank debt here. Mm-hmm. We have the we have the, the closing balance of nine fifty nine hundred and eight fifty, and you'll see the historical calculations for drawdowns and payments. We'll have an if statement in there. It says if it's the last historical if it's if it's an historical period. Mm-hmm. So it's always based on that counter row. Yes. If it's an historical period, take if it to calculate the drawdowns, take the maximum zero, mm-hmm. and the closing balance minus the opening balance. It's basically saying. If the closing balance, if the closing balance is higher than the, the opening balance, assume it's a drawdown. And then we have a min, I think, on the next one. We've got the inverse, yep. Yes, yeah, the inverse. So, so basically what we're saying is <coughs> our drawdowns and repayments, for, that is our net position. That, that is, has to be correct. This is maths. Yes. It might be, it might be a bit weird because technically that period could have been a 500 drawdown and a, and a 550 repayment, mm-hmm. but we don't care, right? It's just the net. It's just the net, right? So that's how that piece balances. And that and that block there goes straight through into our financial statements because that's the key account. Mm-hmm. So if you now go to your balance sheet, your all periods balance sheet on your financial statements and you scroll down and look at debt. Look at our debt. Expand open that up. up. You see that, that literally the closing balance just comes straight through. Boom. Because mm-hmm. that's that's the key account. And if you scroll down to drawdowns and repayments on the cash flow statement. Debt drawdowns and repayments. They're coming straight through as well from the debt facilities. Mm-hmm. Obviously, ignoring the first period because we don't have a balance sheet. Yep. Okay. No calculations. No, sorry, we, don't, we don't have a, 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 a derived. We don't have a cash flow statement mm-hmm. yeah, in that period. Okay, so so the debt balances, which we refer to in the in the annual forecast model as the return, you know, of of capital, mm-hmm. is quite straightforward because it's the key account. The other two, which is interest expense and interest payable, are not key accounts. So they have to go through this weird little second separate module called the debt historical data yes module. and that's where we just do some funky derivations so so if we go back now you can see that as i said to you before the, the interest expense if you go back to the debt data module so go to our uh, capital to our uh, 3e 
the interest expense there, we just assume that equals interest pa- interest paid. So if you go that, you'll see that'll go through the income statement. So that yep. one oh that one oh five point. Oh, let's let's choose another level. Let's choose ninety nine point nine. Ninety nine point nine. Take that and then go to your income statement, all periods income statement, and look at that ninety nine point nine. So where are we? Uh, uh, income statement. Scroll sorry. up under under net interest expense, and you'll see that that. That nine point nine. This just assumed. It's just assumed that's straight through. Yep. And then if you go down to your your cash flow statement, this will be under member. What type of cash flow is is a, is a what type of cash flow is an interest expense? Uh, operating. Operating because yep. it's because it's from the perspective of the shareholders. Mm-hmm. It's an operating expense. So if we go to our interest expense section there, you can see we're assuming that ninety nine equals cash. Yes. Now that's just like what we do with revenue. The working capital, uh, effectively the working capital impact today is if there's a movement in interest payable. So if you now go back to interest payable. We effectively treat the interest payable opening balances within the balance sheet. Uh, so, so, so go to the historical balance sheet. Yes, and again, you can see our debt interest payable goes from twenty five to twenty three to twenty to twenty. Yes, <coughs> so you can see we've gone down in that period by two, mm-hmm. which implies that if your debt payable has gone down, it's a cash out because you paid it back. Yep. You pay back more than you've actually incurred. Um, so, so now if you go to your go to your debt da- historical data module, which is in three E. Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry, sorry, three, sorry, three, oh, three the, the outputs. Yep. And you'll see here we have the debt going from 25 to 23 to 20, and then we have the movement down there. Mm-hmm. Now, that we've actually put that through as a movement. The movement's negative two. So in that case, what we do here to make that balance, because that, that has to balance in its own right. So what we do is it's exactly like working capital, like a debtor. We put the movement through to make it balance. So you'll see that on our on our all periods financials in the historical, if you go to the interest payable balance now down on the balance sheet, up, go up to the balance sheet and go interest payable, which is a current asset, a current liability. Current liability. I love baffling you with those. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that 23 there is gone on. Yep. And to make sure that that movement from the 25 to the 23 is captured, go down to your cash flow statement and we've, we've put it within interest expense. And what that means is well, you, you, you uncompact that interest paid. So I meant interest paid, sorry. You, you uncompact that interest paid line. Mm-hmm. And there's a bit, there's again, there's reverse engineering going on here. But you know that if your interest expense was 99.9, obviously, this is, you could have a lot of reasons behind a lot of this stuff. And that's where if you had a more complex chart of accounts, you'd have more detail on this. But if your interest expense is 99.9 and your debt interest payable movement is is a reduction of two, then that means you paid 101.9 during the period. Yes. So that's how we derive our historical interest paid. Mm-hmm. And it's and it's funny because I think I think we've got in here, just have a look in the it's a, it's worth looking it's worth looking at the the PDF on this. Because it's the same. It's exactly the same logic, right? And it, it messes your head a bit. I love equations. A lot of people don't. But then, but this basically is the key. So you've got your closing interest payable is your opening interest payable plus your interest expense minus your interest paid. Mm-hmm. Therefore, if you reverse engineer that, interest paid equals opening interest payable minus closing interest payable plus interest expense. Or as a negative number on the cash flow statement, interest paid equals negative the interest payable minus opening opening minus closing plus interest expense all negated. Yes. Or you can just say interest paid equals closing interest payable minus opening interest payable, which is the movement in interest payable, mm-hmm. which is which is what I've got the, the increase in interest payable in the cash flow statement. It would have been that two in that yep. example. Yeah, in that case it would have been two. So in this case, in this case the in, the increase, the closing minus the opening is negative two because it's gone down. Mm-hmm. So the increase is negative. Yep. Um, which is which is messes with your head. But that's why we put increase as a word in the cash flow statement to make it clear that an increase is, a, is an, an increase is an increase in cash, a decrease is a decrease in cash. So your interest paid is your closing interest payable minus your opening interest payable minus your interest expense, which is exactly what we've done here. Mm-hmm. And that's how we've derived our interest paid. Okay. Okay, so with our debt balances, they were the key account, didn't have to worry about it. Interest expense, we didn't really care about it, we just assumed it equals cash because it's a p and item. With the, but with the interest payable, we had, to, we had to actually take the movement and put that through and the net effectively of the interest expense and interest payable is your interest your, your derived interest paid on the cash flow statement? Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so let's go to our now. Let's just do the forecast. So let's go to our assumptions file and put in our our funds drawn and working capital. Uh, sorry, let's put our bank debt and working capital facility forecast in. Cool. This is exactly the same logic and flows as the annual forecast model exercise, mm-hmm. and that's obviously why we made that ex- that exercise a prerequisite for this one. So we've got 10% and 15%. 10% and 15%. So probably the most confusing thing about this, just like the annual forecast model, is understanding why we've used that debt historical data module. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a lot of ways you could do it. For example, what you could do is you could put in some some one-to-many mapping tool for, for, for interest expense, historical interest expense and historical debt interest payable. 
um, that would actually enable you to map those data. Say, say you had ten of historical interest events, you could allocate it to your clo- your debt and closing Pro-rata facilities, or pro rata. Or, yeah. But it gets really messy, and you sort of sort of sit and it goes. You've sort of got to think, how material is this? Like, oh, I'm doing this to provide some degree of historical perspective to my forecast, so I can say, oh, I'm forecasting debt interest events next year of twenty million dollars. Last year it was two. What the heck? Yep. You know, that's what it's there for. It's not re- if you want to do really, really, if you want to do really, really, really accurate accounting like this, what you can do is you can actually marry your interest expense, interest payable, and closing balances, put them in the same categories group in one big mega module, mm-hmm. and actually bring the data in so it's always the same. I don't think you'll get that out of your accounting package. No. Um, you can also obviously add interest expense categories and, and, and change the assumption. So if the assumption comes in as 10, you can change it and go, oh, listen, let's add two more categories of interest expense and make that five, three, and two, mm-hmm. right? If you want to do that. And the only downside of this structure is they won't be side by side of the financials, but they'll still be aligned in terms of you'll be able to see them. Mm-hmm. So it's all down to materiality. But if you look at the links on this now, you just look at the links for, for the for the debt module, you'll see that that's obviously one debt facility you've got there. Yes. And the debt facilities behave exactly the same way in, in a historical in an historical and forecast rolling model as they do in a forecast because all you're doing is taking the key account and mm-hmm. forecasting the components. Yep. So <clears throat> because we've thrown away all the complexities of the non-key accounts, Debt facilities are a beautifully simple thing. We just take the opening balance as the last closing balance on the historical balance sheet and, and act like we're in a forecast only model. And that debt historical data module, which is which sits in the outputs as just a bunch of derived calculations, is the key to giving you that simplicity. Okay. So you can now pump in new debt modules, do all sorts of funky stuff, create the most complex debt module in the world there, and it will work beautifully still because you've thrown away the historical reconciliation you know, pain. You'll just be bringing through that, that opening balance. Yeah. And as I said, you, you could build some really complex stuff to to get around this to make it more beautifully mapped, but I've never needed, I've never had a problem with doing this way. Okay. Most most people don't do anything near this, this sophisticated. So, you know, you're doing well. <coughs> okay, so do we just view, yeah, we view the debt links? Cool. Yes. Okay, so that is, let's just go to the balance sheet, including debt, and make sure that our net assets at the end of 2023 is 2485.6. Correct. Beautiful. We're still winning. Okay, so ordinary equity. Ordinary equity is relatively simple. Unless I'm missing something, <laughs> which I which I might be, but but there's only one complex part about this, and that is that the way we use dividends declared, which we're going to discuss in a moment. Ordinary equity is not as complicated as debt because it's 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 most in 99.9 percent of cases it's not category based. You know you don't okay. have multiple categories of, of lowest ranking ordinary equity. You might have mes debt, uh, preference shares, convertible notes, but all of those things are uh, those those sort of those sort of uh, you know hybrid type instruments in between senior debt and equity. Um, they're, they're more treated like categories of, of debt with different implications for tax purposes than they are modeling you know, ordinary equity, which is normally just one tranche of shares. Mm-hmm. Every company has to have common stock. So in this case, it's relatively simple. So let's go. Let's just go to the historical financials. And you'll see that the... On the balance sheet? No, this, yeah, the, historical, the historical income statement doesn't include anything to do with equity, right? Absolutely. Because, yeah, it doesn't include any equity at all because it's, it's, it's not an operating expense. So no. It's not reported on there. So we go to our financials. Equity just appears as equity down in the equity section of the balance sheet, ordinary equity, and we have dividends payable. So you can see we have dividends payable up above. Mm -hmm. Now, this is interesting because if you can remember in the annual forecast model, the way we forecast the balance sheet is (coughs) retained profits. It's between the opening retained profits balance. And if you actually go to the the, the financial statements, so go to the output, the all periods financial statements, and just just look at, say, a forecast period 2019 Mm -hmm. and look at our... Or open up the retained profit section at the bottom. Okay. Now, this is how we forecast retained profits. Now, in 99.9% of cases, you take your closing retained profits balance from the last period, you add your your net profit after tax, and you subtract your dividends declared, and that gives you your closing retained profits. And that's like one of the all-time great sanity checks of your model. Mm-hmm. Your earnings flow through into your retained profits, your cash flows through into your cash, and that's the linkages between your three financial statements other than all the data coming from everywhere else. Yep. So... In order for that, based on that, we can sit there and say, okay, historically, if the user's given us their entire historical income statement and they've given us their entire balance sheet and we've reverse engineered retained profits and said that's the balancing item, then effectively the movement in our retained profits has to equal, has to be equal to net profit after tax, um, net, net, the net, net of net profit after tax and dividends declared. Mm-hmm. Now, the problem we've got is that we, we know net profit after tax because they've given it to us. So there's only one item we're missing. The divs and that's declared. Where, the divs declared. And that's where, and that's where, and this, this is controversial in that if you've got really bad quality historical data, 
you got to end up with some weird dividends to Cloud9 because the systems. If you put in, if you put in like your retained your net net profit after tax on your PL as making, you know, thousands of you know millions of dollars of profits, and then your um, your retained profits don't reflect that on your balance sheet because you put weird numbers in your balance sheet. This this historical derivation is going to actually just bang that all through dividends to Cloud. Mm-hmm. So it's a bit of a sanity check as to whether your actual as to whether your dividends as to whether your, your historical data is actually meaningful. Okay, so if you look at what I've got on my screen right now, we've got closing dividends payable, like I just said. Small formulas. Yep. You've got to do the formulas with this stuff. Yep. Closing dividends payable because opening dividends payable plus dividends declared minus dividends paid. Okay? So therefore, dividends paid equals opening dividends payable minus dividends, uh, closing dividends payable plus dividends declared, which if you simplify it down, means dividends paid equals your closing dividends payable minus your opening dividends payable minus your dividends declared. Okay, so, so it's funny. So that's where if you go down now, if you go down to the cash flow statement and do dividends paid, which will be under the financing um, activities, dividends ordinary paid. dividends paid, open that up, you'll see we have the historical dividends declared. Um, we have, and then we have basically closing minus, so the dividends paid equals closing dividends payable minus opening dividends payable, which is the increase in dividends, in historical dividends payable, which we've got there of 9.7. Mm-hmm. And then we have minus dividends declared, which is 188.1. Now that 188.1, that 188.1, the historical dividends declared, if you click on that, you traverse that, you'll see that's coming from the balance sheet because we're deriving it. Right. <clears throat> and that's the key to this because that's your plug. That's your plug to make that work, to, to actually make the balance sheet balance. Yes. And that's that we've, we've made balance sheet balance through retained profits, but the only item we, we didn't know, because we know it, our, our cash literally, you've got the movement in cash. Yeah. We, we've got it, we've got, and we've, we've derived our cash flow statement. So we assume the movement in cash effectively is correct. And the, the retained profits balancing item means the only unknown item is that dividends declared amount. Mm-hmm. And that's why in those historical periods, at the moment, we've got dividends declared of, if you just go up to the balance sheet. On the balance sheet, yes. Uh, we have our dividends declared. You'll see under, under row 151, dividends declared. Go to K151. K151. Okay. Yep. Here. Uh, the row below. Uh, yeah, there. Go. So you see here, if you traverse that, we're saying if it's the first period, ignore it. Otherwise, if it's an historical period, let's do this calc. Otherwise, just take the dividends declared from the actual from the actual ordinary equity module. module. Yep. But let's go back to that calc. That calc is literally saying, okay, calculate it as we, the retained profits balance is coming in from our historical balance sheet because it's the balancing item. Yep. So our retained profits balance of 364.1, we know that. We're now our opening balance is the prior period, which is that 298.8. Yep. We're now our net profit after tax from our historical income statement was 253.4. Mm-hmm. So therefore, necessarily, our d- dividends declared in that period must be 188.1. Yep. That's it. And then we put that through the cash flow statement along with our movement in dividends payable, mm-hmm. and that gives us our dividends paid. So right. it's complicated stuff in that in that it's complicated purely because we had to back solve because dividends declared don't uh, aren't imported from your historical financials. Mm-hmm. Now, <clears throat> you could potentially amend your historical balance sheet to allow the importation of dividends declared assumptions. We don't do that because most a lot of accounting packages don't provide them. Mm-hmm. Um, if you get your numbers right, that should be great. Yes. It's a great check. But always look and go, if there's a weird dividends declared number in there and you're like, hey, I own the business. I didn't declare a dividend. Then you know your data's probably wrong. Right. Something's messed up. Okay. Okay, so let's go to our forecast. Let's go to our forecast. Um, our forecast ordinary equity assumptions. So capital. And we're just going to put in <coughs> we get the numbers for this. Uh, let's just copy and paste those in. Easy. I think we've got, we've got a 50 buyback in 2019 and a 50 buyback in 2021. Yep, correct. And then we're using percentage of NPAT for our dividends, and we're doing 50% in every period. And 50%. we're limiting we're limiting that to cash, which I don't think it matters here because we don't have negative cash. So we've got all positive anyway. Yep. Yep. So let's go to our ordinary equity outputs. Make sure that our dividends, let's just check our dividends declared in the final period, uh, is 159.0. Uh, on the payable? Yes. On the, on the payable, yep. And then and you'll see we've got we've got 50% paid in, we've got 50%, um, yeah, 50% of NPAT. So that should be our NPAT. Let's have a look. And then so our NPAT for the period is 318. Is that right? Yeah, yep. 318. And then we, we're just checking down to check if we've got valid, viable cash, which we do. We've got plenty of cash. We've got heaps of cash. So therefore, the actual dividends declared is 150. Um, percentage paid during period. What have we got for a percentage paid during period? Uh, oh, no. We, sorry. With dividends, we assume just like in the annual forecast model, they're paid in the subsequent period. Yeah. And we've just done that purely because obviously you declare them after the period's ended and paid in the next period. And given it's an annual model, that's always the case. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that means after doing that, we should now go. Let's go. Just go to our. Let's go to our financial statements. Now let's just check. What have we got for our net assets? Net one, assets one six five one point seven. Correct. 
That's correct. So the important thing to bear in mind with, with ordinary equity is when you're doing that historical uh, derivation of the cash flow, you, you need to take your derived dividends declared, which are derived on the balance sheet based on the reconciliation of retained profits, feed that into your cash flow statement as part of calculating your dividends paid, which are also derived based on your movement in your dividends payable. So the net of the movement in your dividends payable and your dividends declared, mm -hmm. which is very, very similar to interest expense, where it's your net of your interest expense and your movement in your debt interest expense payable. Mm -hmm. It's very similar, but for the fact that interest expense appears in the income statement, we didn't have that. So we had to derive dividends declared, which is effectively the equivalent of interest expense, but for equity. Yep. If your brain hasn't exploded yet. <laughs> There's well. a lot in that. There's a lot in that. No, okay. that's cool. Okay, so let's go to our corporate taxation. Corporate yeah. tax, we're almost, we're, almost, we're almost through this. So 2H. So 2H. Now, corporate taxation, again, um, with tax expense, yep. okay, this is an easy one, mm -hmm. relatively, given the road we've been down. It's the corporate taxation basically has, for historical purposes, corporate tax expense, on the income statement. So if you go to the historical income statement, corporate tax expenses between net profit before tax and net profit after tax, there it is down there. And then we've got our, on our balance sheet, historical balance sheet, we have our corporate tax payable, which is just a current liability up there. Yep. There's no categories. So no. it's pretty straightforward. Yep. So there's no mapping required. Mm -hmm. It's easy. So this is very, very similar. Go to our go to our corporate tax assumptions in one, uh, in two, H. H. And we're just going to put a corporate tax rating of 40%. 40%. No tax losses, no other provisions or adjustments, and we're just going to put 75% pay during period. So, so. <coughs> and, and this is exactly the same as annual forecast model. Mm -hmm. So if you go to the outputs on that, just go to the outputs on that and just open up the, the open up the columns and on just look columns. what's happening here. So all we need to worry about here is bringing through our historical tax payable and tax expense because they're the only two items we've got. Mm -hmm. so, so we make sure they come through. So here you'll see how our tax expense is coming through in those periods, the tax the tax um, closing tax payable is the forty seven point seven. Um, that's the closing balance. Mm -hmm. So just like with the other one, if we look, what if we put, we put more equations in here? This it's this, you'll see it's it's the same concept for all of this. Yeah. So if you look at the corporate tax, our closing tax payable because our opening tax payable plus tax expense on the income statement minus our tax paid on the cash flow. Mm -hmm. the problem is for historical purposes we need to derive tax paid because we're deriving our cash flow. So in this case we're going to say tax paid therefore equals our opening tax payable plus our tax expense, minus our closing tax payable. Or tax paid equals, you could, or negating it equals this, because we need a negative on the cash flow statement. Yep. Because it's a cash outflow. So tax paid equals closing tax payable, minus opening, which is also increasing tax payable, mm -hmm. um, minus tax expense. So if you go to the cash flow statement now. Yes. So you scroll flow. down, scroll down the cash flow, and just go to tax paid, corporate tax paid. You'll see here we have our historical tax expense come straight through. Mm -hmm. And then we have an increase in corporate tax payable. And it, there's always going to be zero for the forecast tax pay because that's that's obviously forecast only. Yep. So our corporate, our implied, uh, I should say our derived corporate tax paid for 2017 is the 184.1. Because we, re we reported a tax expense of 179.9, but we recorded a, a decrease in tax payable of 4.2, yep. which means we actually paid more tax than we incurred. Mm -hmm. So we have 184.1. And that's that's how we derive our corporate tax pay, which is our balance sheet balances. Yes. So if you go back to our corporate tax, just go back to our outputs of our corporate tax and open up the columns, you'll see that the, the top section up there, yeah, where you're hovering around the mouse, that's what passes through. We pass through that tax expense benefit. We pass through that closing tax payable. Um, and you'll see the tax paid is the tax paid, if you scroll down, tax payable and paid. I'm just trying to look out what we, Oh, no, sorry. Then, then the cash flow statement takes those two mm -hmm. and, and, and derives it. Yep. That's it because the net of those two has to be it. So I'm just trying to find the movement. If you... um. If you open, just open under closing tax payable, there it is there. There's our movement. There's our movement. Mm -hmm. And that's the cap that makes sure that that still balances. Mm -hmm. And if you check the balance error checks result now, that balance check there, the tax payable, you see that if it says, um, yeah, I don't think it's actually checking for historical period, is it? No. Because it must be. It's got to balance because we yep. take that. Yeah. Okay, it's just taking the movement. Okay, so, so that's how it works. That line, in that hidden section we've included at the bottom, movement in historical tax payable, is the reason why it balances. Yes. And once again, you don't have your historical tax items going straight into your periods. They go through this. This does the check, does the derivation, and passes through the components. Okay, so let's just run the module links tool on that. So again, build tab, look at those links. Yep. <clears throat> so here we have... Yeah, so, yep. yeah, so incredibly similar, incredibly similar to our forecast only. Only with our forecast only uh, annual forecast model, we didn't have, uh, we didn't have historical income statement 
Um, but it was very similar. We, we got net profit before tax linking in from our oil periods, which is what we used to forecast based on a percentage of NPAT, which yep. is our dividend, which is sorry, which is our um, our corporate, sorry, which is how we calculate our tax payable based on profit. That's how we get our taxable profit. And our historical income statement is bringing that tax expense for that derivation we talked about. Then the closing tax payable is used to derive the historical tax paid, no, and it's maybe. also used the basis for forecasting tax payable. Yeah. So that's it. And that's corporate tax. Otherwise, other than that derivation. And that's the common thing with all of this. You have the historical cash flow statement derivation complexities, and then you're back where you were in the annual forecast model. Yeah. So that's why these courses, they're so layered. You need to actually understand, I mean, to be honest, you need to understand best practice modeling so you can then understand assumptions versus outputs. And then you go in and start understanding modular development. And then you need to understand the financial modeling fundamentals that we covered in annual forecast model. And then this is the rolling mechanism. Yes. So they're, they're just layers. And if you do each layer one at a time, you can you can digest them and look at what's going on. Go through the formulas, have a play. Mm-hmm. Everything makes sense. I've always said you, you can build an enormous house. You rip, look at one brick; it's not overwhelming. If someone says build build a coliseum with bricks, you're gonna like that's gonna kill me. But if you just one brick at a time, and with this stuff, it's it's all about layered learning, and that's why these courses you've got to do them in the right order and understand the concepts. So let's finish it off. So we've got other financial statement items, exactly the same as the forecast model. So let's do interest on cash. Oh, we've just got one percent for the base rate. And then for all periods, and in deposits margin, we have 1%. Overdraft margin, 2%. And if you just look, just while you're there, just do just do like okay, just do module links on that. Easy. And you'll see that's exactly the same as yep. the other revenue. Mm-hmm. So it's just, it's coming in. Um, we, it does bring in the cash balance. It brings in the opening cash balance so we can forecast it. But if you close that and just open up here, open up, go to the outputs. I'm going to go to the outputs and just open that up. You see that interest on cash? There's your calc. There's your if prior period. If prior period, pass straight through. Yep, straight through. Otherwise, forecast, that's going to go to the income statement, go to the all periods income statement, and that other financial statement items, that's going to bring you in just out. It's just going to be a part of net interest expense mm-hmm. on the on the income statement. There, yeah. it, is, there it is there. Uh, interest on cash above that. And then scroll down to the cash flow statement, and that'll come through as, as effectively as, as interest, just on, that interest on cash, one line. Yep. Okay, so it's just treated like revenue, mm-hmm. and it's just cash. I mean, we, we assume there's no working capital impacts of that. It's just cash received from the bureau. Easy. Which is normally really important. So let's go to the other balance sheet items and paste those in from the forecast. It's a whole bunch of bits and pieces here, just like last time. Yep. So, so we've got 50 for non current assets. Operating, operating. Yep. 50, and then put in the two categories for other current liabilities, credit cards, and other. And then provisions, really leases, other. I've only really got anything for provisions. And then five of other equity. Yep. And just scrolling down, those prepayments and other are both operating. Yep. Rental, bond, and direct loans are operating. Other is investing. Credit cards is credit cards is cash payments. Other is operating cash flows. Provisions and leases are operating. Uh, other is financing cash flows. And other equity is financing. Cool. cool. So let's go to the outputs on this one as well. The outputs on this one, it's it's again, this is the same concept. So if you look at where, where the, you see the summary where everything links out here, mm-hmm. you see here that these are just asset balances. So what we do is we derive, you see the cash flow impacts there? We, we basically derive the cash flow impacts. So here here we've got our, um, oh, let's have a look at this. So, so let's look at one of these line items. So you look at something like, um, this is the movements in this. Yes. So here cash flow impacts the 27 cash payments. That's basically the movement in that period. Now it's funny, that first period doesn't mean a lot. Arguably we should get rid of it. Yeah. It does, doesn't do anything. So it's, it's better to look at say a second period. So if you look at the second period, um, because we've allocated those assets to different things. So the other current assets, for example. So the other current assets go from 15 to 15. There's no change there. Let's go down where there is a change. So other non-current assets, that goes from 345 to 345. You'll see when it goes from... Current liabilities? Yeah, so right, let's look at that, that third period. So let's go on... Um, yeah, current liabilities. So where we go that 40 to 44, mm-hmm. an increase in liability is generally an increase in cash because yep. you're not paying your bills. That's the way I always view it. Which means, which we, and we've allocated those to cash payments and other op, and other operating cash flows. That's a four increase in cash. Mm-hmm. So you look at that forty to forty four there, other current liabilities. If you go to the balance sheet, go to the, the all periods balance sheet. Just look at that data. Other mm-hmm. current liabilities. Yes. Yes, yeah, so other current liabilities. There, there's the forty four, and then if you go down to your cash flow statement, um, you'll see we allocated. I think if you go back to the outputs on the on the on the other, go to the back to the other outputs, other financial statement items outputs. We, we had of that 40, we had three of it going through cash payments, other current liabilities, cash payments. So if you just go to your cash flow statement, you should have an inflow of three on the cash flow statement under other current 
on the yep. financial statements. Financial statements, cash flow. Just go down to cash flow and do other current liabilities. So it's going to be. Um, there's this other. other oh, oh, sorry, other cash payments. Yes. Other cash payments. Sorry, my bad. So there's our three. And there's the three there. Three increases. Okay, so all we've done here, all we've done here is we've we've basically put the balance sheet items straight into the balance sheet, mm-hmm. and then put the movements in them. We've derived the movements in that. If you go back to the outputs of the other other balance sheet items, we've derived those outputs. So if you look at you look at that four that we looked at, the three, the three, sorry, that three is obviously the movement. Yes. So it's the movement. It's the difference between the opening and the closing for that category. So if you just tra- just just um, traverse that formula. And you can see there, look at the movement, look at the cap. Uh, <coughs> so oh. that one there, let's go to the end of that. Yeah, there. So that, that part there, you see what see the there's the sum. Now if you just double click on that, go to those. Go to those. And go to that three. Yes. And that three there, if you just traverse that, that three is just the, literally the closing. In this case, because it's a um what is this? In this, uh, this case, other current period. liability. Yep. So in current liabilities, increases and increase in cash. So it's literally going to be the closing minus the opening, yep. which is what that should be. So the closing was 30, the opening was 27. That's where we're through. Okay, so, and that is really the fundamental concept. The other current, other, other balance sheet items, other balance sheet items modules are a really great one for understanding how to customize the financials because, you know, you basically say, I don't know what these things are. They shouldn't be stupidly material. Just like we covered in the annual forecast model, you say it's a liability that's gone up, probably means I've got cash coming in the bank. An obvious example of the liability going up is debt. You take on hold of the debt, you get a hold of the cash. Um, so, or, or a creditor where you send out a liability going up is where you basically receive an invoice from somebody, but you don't pay. You keep your hands on the cash, but your net assets position change. Your net assets position basically changes, but you're you're still holding onto your cash. Mm-hmm. Okay, so so that it's really important to understand how that's put through because the way in which that balances that module, you can use that mentality to apply to any customization of financial statements. Around. And that's basically that's basically the forecast. So let's let's look at the all periods financials. Okay, so let's go to the all periods financial statement, the income statement. And just make sure our final period should be 326.9. Yep. That's done. And as we went through all that financial statement is literally still bringing in data, just like the forecast, annual forecast model. Mm-hmm. All the complex stuff that makes them really complex for the historical forecast rolling is done within the within the forecast module, just like the revenue module. So the revenue module, the revenue forecast module isn't just five years. It's eight years. And it contains three years of historical analysis in there. But we've just grouped and hidden it away because we don't want to confuse people. Mm-hmm. So it's um, just that pass through. That's it. So yep. let's go to the income statement links. So module links, build links. And, and you'll see this is exactly the same, <coughs> exactly the same as what you see in the annual forecast mm-hmm. because it doesn't link directly in from the historical income statement. That's the key. It looks exactly the same. I think you know, other than the fact that the debt historical data module is called debt historical data instead of debt opening data, which yep. we talked about, it's exactly the same. Okay. Let's just have a quick look at the balance sheet. Make sure our balance sheet net assets in the final period is 1672.4. Yep. Done. And let's look at the module links on that. Same again. Again, now this is exactly the same links as what you'd expect from um, exactly the same links as what you'd expect from an all periods. Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry, from a forecast only financial model. But the data, the, the opening balances, the, the opening cash balance, which in this case is the closing historical cash balance and the retained profits balance is coming from the historical balance sheet not the opening balance sheet. Yep. Other than that, it still takes NPAT from the all-periods income statement. It still takes changing cash from the all-periods cash flow, and everything's dandy. So it's just those two levels of historical were opening. Exactly, exactly. And that's the important thing. I think a lot of people build an historical forecast model and their entire their entire all-periods balance sheet has if statements around it saying, hey, if I'm a historical period, do this. It shouldn't. You deal with that on the way through mm-hmm. from the historical financial statements. Okay, so let's just look at the cash flow statement. And it's worth noting that our forecasts in this model should, are identical to the five-year forecast in the forecast-only model, but we have a side-by-side comparison with historical, yep. and we can roll this forward really easily. It was the forecast-only model we couldn't. Cool. And so the cash flow statement, and just make sure, let's just make sure our cash in the final period of the cash flow statement is 146.4. Yep, yeah, our right. change in cash. Yep. And let's look at the links. So the links here. And you'll see exactly the same concept. Now, now the, the interesting thing is we do have that weird link coming in from the dividends declared from the balance sheet. Mm-hmm. That's because obviously we had to derive dividends declared in the balance sheet, which is that balancing item for historical purposes. So that dividends declared is specifically coming through for that purpose. Right. Um, other than that, um, and the closing cash balance. Um, it's funny, the closing cash balance is also coming into the cash flow statement, which is interesting. Yeah. Um, opening. Let's double click on that link. I'll tell you why that's coming. Yeah, so open that up. Is that, yeah, that, that is an historical cash reconciliation. So that, that's a rec we've put in there 
just to make sure that people understand the implications of the historical data they put in. Mm-hmm. So that's another wheel of the link we've added to say, listen, your historical balance sheet saying you're closing cash is this, this, and this. Our historical cash flow statement, which is derived, is saying this. What's the difference? If there is a difference, something really wacky is going on. Yep. And that's a check we've put in because you can put absolute rubbish into your historical financials because we balance them through the retained profits. So that's sort of coming in saying, eh, the data the, the data's still not working, but there's some really weird stuff going on. Yep. So that's why that link is there. And that is and that is your historical forecast model. So that's that is you can see the process is largely identical to the annual forecast model, <coughs> but for understanding all the mechanisms. So the majority of this course is focused on understanding that rolling mechanism the derivation of the historical cash flow statement in the all periods cash flow statement um, and understanding how you map key accounts when you have multiple sets of data in the historical financial statements and you've got categories based data but you don't have direct mapping of those categories that allows you to do that. And you see we've got presentation outputs in here. I think we've got a presentation output dashboard. You can see the beautiful thing about an all periods um, and historical forecast model is you actually end up having historical forecast data. We've still only got, we've still only got Five, um, we've still only got five years on this, mm-hmm. which is funny because you can really easily extend these models. Do you want to have a crack at extending it? Give it a go. So let's just, just insert three columns. Um, just insert three nuts. Yes, yeah, select column I. Select column I and just insert, yes, yeah, select across decay and just insert columns. Let's see if this works. Here drum roll. Drum roll. How does it work? It should drag it across. There and we there go. go. And there you go. So we've got, and then you do the same for revenue across the right. Just insert three columns. Uh, no, no, not there. Not there. I'll do it. Uh, yeah, there. I'll do it there. It's actually, right, it shouldn't matter. Shouldn't it really. It won't should matter. drag it, it out. It shouldn't matter. Um, but that's a beautiful thing as well because these dashboards are effectively custom scalable. And there you go. Okay, and then you've, and then you've got your charts that can reflect that as well. There you go. <laughs> so that's, that's your financial statement summary. Now you have the beauty. In a, in a historical rolling model, you have the ability to, to view historical and forecast data side by side. Obviously, the, the derived cash flow statement only starts from period two onwards. Um, what we're going to talk about in the next in the budget variance analysis training course next um, is, is how you do the roll forward, yes. uh, update new data, and do budgets versus actual comparisons for budget variance analysis purposes. But this model is now able to be rolled forward as, say, a strategic planning model, um, which which is just inc- insanely powerful because you don't need to worry about changing any formulas. Awesome. And that is an historical forecast financial model. I hope this made sense, guys. We've got support on our website. Um, and a whole lot more information in the PDF that we've gone through. So I hope you've enjoyed this and see you next time.